It's time for Windows Weekly, episode 192. Paul Therat is here, and boy, is he in a depressed spirits. Bad mood about Windows Phone. We'll talk about the missing Windows Phone update and a whole lot more. Windows Weekly, right after this. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 192, recorded January 20th, 2011. Holy Schmidt! Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. For your free audiobook, go to audible.com slash windows. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, visit Squarespace.com slash windows. And don't forget to use the offer code windows on checkout to save 10%. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything you need to know about all that stuff going on in Redmond, Washington, the Microsoft campus, like the Xbox 360, the Zoom, Microsoft Windows, Windows Server, the late, great Windows Home Server, and more, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Speaking of late and great, here he is, my friend and yours, Paul Therott, the editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows at winsupersite.com. You see, I'm, I'm practicing for uh, the Golden Globe Awards next year. I hear Gervais won't be back. I was going to say, there's an opening <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the top spot. Paul is also a, a news editor for Windows IT Pro and um, an analyst for Penton Media and the author of... <laughs> I'm going to embarrass you. This book, Windows Vista Secrets. <laughs> Yikes. Right. I'm actually two behind now. Message received. You know, I'm not actually a huge fan of paper. Maybe what I will do is... Well, I have send... Windows 7 Secrets on the Kindle. I have yeah, Windows gonna, Phone Secrets on a Kindle, but no you, good holding up a Kindle. I'll send you all of my books. You know and what? And you can just put them up on a shelf. Paul, just, then, I bought that one. I spent my good money on that that's one. That's not, I see, I don't, I don't. Uh, but I, don't it, we, I would mucho appreciate it. You don't have to send me uh, the complete Paul Therott library. No, I don't want it here. I don't want it here. I'm just going to box it up. <laughs> the seven-foot shelf, not needed. Although, I wouldn't mind that Delphi Bible. The Super Bible. I have a I have a version of it in Russian. Oh, that would be good. I could I think I, I have a Korean version. I could read it in Russian. No, but I would actually like the latest, which is Windows Phone Secrets, covering all of the new Windows Phone. And I want to ask you because you wrote about this. I think this ha we, this has to be our lead story. Okay. What sorry, the sorry. hell sorry. is going on with the uh, data billing? Because Microsoft yeah. says it's a rogue third party application. You you disagree. You differ. There's no way that's it. There's no way. Because it happens when the phone is off, when the phone is sitting all alone at night. Listen, we all know that Windows Phone does not multitask. How could it possibly be an app running in the background when you can't have an app running in the background? So, well, you we'll know, see. wait a minute. Unless they're using some kind of secret thing or... I, my I find myself in the odd position of defending Redmond. Listen, I, I have... I, I'm not usually this sarcastic. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> but. Really? Th this week, I'm in a little bit of a mood. Are you? Yeah. That's uh, So, uh, I suppose it's possible that the Facebook service that's built into Windows Phone. Right. Could be the culprit. But how could they call that a third-party service? Did they really have this brand-new smartphone platform and let Facebook build that for them, and then they just added it into the phone? In which case, it's still sort of their fault, isn't it? So, my theory is that actually Microsoft built that service all completely by themselves and that Facebook has nothing to do with it. So it really can't be that. I think I suggest let's uh, perhaps we should backtrack here and kind of for people who yeah. haven't heard this story, say what's going on. There's a, there's a 3G, I guess, data leak is what you call it problem. What does that mean? I'm getting billed? Yeah. So the way this started was, uh, and this happened back in the summer when I switched over last summer, when I switched over from the iPhone to Windows phone. I began looking at my data usage. And of course, in the very early days of Windows Phone, before the App Store opened in particular, um, there wasn't a lot of data usage. Uh, the other thing that skews this, unfortunately, in my case, is that in August, we did that three-week home swap. So I don't have 
I don't have an accurate figure for August that makes any sense. Because you were overseas, it was I was overseas and using it a lot more than I would have. Right. And it's not really, you know, part of that. So, but what I noticed is it's gone up every month until actually last the month. The amount of data consumed has gone up. My data month. usage went up. So, uh, as a, in the course of just documenting this every month, you know, once a month I would get my AT&T bill. I would look at the data usage for the previous month, enter it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then you could see this kind of linear path going up. And what I was saying, the reason I was doing it is because AT&T switched to a tiered data plan uh, or to tiered data plans last year. So you can get 200 megabytes of data each month or two gigabytes of data. And I'm grandfathered in on the unlimited plan because I had the iPhone from years ago. But I was curious, you know, this phone uses a lot of data. It's designed to be integrated with all these online services. You know, is this going to be a problem? Like, what, what will this look like for people? So I figured I would document this. So I'm seeing this thing go up every month. And I'm, and I'm not, it's not like I'm using the phone more. You know, I didn't use it more in December than I did in November. I mean, I tend to have the same usage patterns overall, I think. Well, how much but, more data? Are we talking 50%, 100%? Yeah, I, I, mean, I should, yeah, I should probably have been looking at this. I mean, is it, is it a gig? Is it a, is it, well, are you I, over the I limits, I guess, is the most important No, thing. I'm not. So what I discovered was early on that 200 megabytes wasn't going to cut it. Uh, yeah, and that I anyone mean, who has a Windows phone Anybody needs, knows that. It needs the two gig plan. Now, I mean, how, how fast, just out of curiosity, you, you, did you go through the first 200 megabytes a day? Oh, that's a good, I don't even, a week? I'm not sure. So, no, I mean, I, listen, you know, you may, you, you could make certain assumptions about me that I'm some kind of crazy, you know, data use guy because of what I do and everything. That's really not the case at all. In fact, no, I've often you said, don't work in an office. You don't travel as much. You probably use yeah. Wi-Fi 90% yeah. of the time. Yeah. 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 So what I saw was in, in uh, from August to September, it went from about 50 megabytes to about 180. The next month, it was 310. Oh, interesting. The month after that, it was uh, 500 and... Oh, that's, so okay, you know what? That's a big bump. And that doesn't sound yeah. like your usage suddenly changed. No. And, and it was, on the other hand, you know, of course, the, 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 but the marketplace did open up, you know, although I do all you of my... Downloaded a lot of apps... But I do that over Wi-Fi. Okay. I know. I you know my yeah. phones are all connected. All my right. devices are connected right. to the Wi-Fi sure, and network course. here. Yeah. I live in a a dead zone of sorts for all networks. By you the know, way, can I ask this uh, question? I know it's happening to you. It's happening to others. Is it only happening on the AT and T Samsung Focus? Yeah, I don't know. So here's the thing. So in in the course of writing about this, I'm writing about one thing. I'm just writing about data consumption and for your whatever, and your experience. My experience. This is just me. So, but what has happened is hundreds of people are writing back in the in the comment section on the blog and they're saying, oh yeah, you know, I'm seeing this weird thing where, you know, I leave the, the phones off or it's connected to a wireless network and then I get the bill and I went over the limit or I got, you know, and people, ch when people read that, they chime in and lots and lots of that stuff going on. So Microsoft finally, uh, in a very rare move for their Windows phone guys, uh, contacted me and said, what's going, you know, we're going to look into this and um, if you could provide any more information, you know. Do you have like the, logs? Is there, do they ask you for secret, you know, secret well, logs? Well, here's the, so a lot of information comes out over time. So some people will say, oh, I looked at my AT&T bill because, right. you know, for all their problems, AT&T has some excellent stuff going on. And one of the things they do very well is their billing and the, uh, the information you can get online or on the phone itself. And they do a nice job with that stuff. So people will look at their logs essentially on the website at AT&T wireless and they'll say look at this thing it says it says at two o'clock in the morning I used you know a gigabyte of data not a gigabyte but some hundreds of megabytes of data and I was asleep and the phone was sitting here off and that's impossible but actually AT&T posts things at times that aren't always the time that it was used right they'll aggregate the uh, the data uses from the day, perhaps, or something. So that's not necessarily anything, you know. I can, I can vouch for that. I just got a twelve hundred dollar AT and T bill. Oh, nice. And uh, I think mm, I have to look at the details. As you say, they they itemize well, but I'm guessing probably nine hundred ninety nine dollars of that is in Paris in December. Right. You gotta you gotta buy, be buying those uh, international. I did. Okay. Huh. Uh, well, but I did. I mean, I, well, so, well this, the thing I was talking about in August is I don't remember the exact tiers, but I, for August, uh, we were in Germany for three weeks. And I said, you know what? I'm going to buy the most expensive plan for data usage. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to use the hell out of this thing. And it's and like it, a buck a so, megabyte. But uh, about, like, you know what, though? We couldn't use it. I mean, I think we got oh, pretty close by it. the end. But, but about halfway through the trip, we started u leaving the GPS on in the car all the time, even when we really? didn't need it, just to just use the data. <laughs> and we, I'm serious. I'll be damned if I'm going home with any unused data. Uh, well, I sp it was probably cost two hundred dollars. I don't remember what the top end one was. I, I but have to look at my bill. I, I remember saying to my wife, "Twelve hundred dollars." We are going to use this, you know, 
all of this data. And I, I'm telling you, we came, we came close, but I don't think we hit it. It was very difficult. Uh, right, but, you know, having done what you curious. did, because, you know, in previous trips to Europe, I've come back and had the same thing, $1,000 or $1,100. Yeah. And right. you thought you did the right thing before you left. And you did. Yep. You have to be careful with that stuff. No, and, and in China, I had the same problem. And so uh, this time I was extraordinarily careful. It was an iPhone. I monitored. Well, I don't, you, didn't, you didn't do something right because yeah. uh, I, I can't. No, yeah. You weren't there that long. I mean, how could I was you possibly there five do days. Yeah. So even if you spent, if, if you spent the most you could spend, it would have been 200 bucks. And you wouldn't have even come close. There's no way. I'm baffled. So you should talk to AT&T. They, they've got good customer service, and they'll they'll look at you and realize you've been there for a long time. Yeah, the last time they, we, we worked it out, they said, well, what we'll do, we'll give you another month. <laughs> we'll add the two months together. Then we'll only charge you for the overage, so it will only be eight or $900. Maybe. I don't so know. I'm sure we'll I can see, they, They've, they've actually been pretty bucks. accommodating. For they've, they've been pretty good to me in the past. I don't remember the details of how I worked it out, but I'm, I'm going to check my bill. actually... Yeah, I, and talk to them because yeah. they'll, they'll they're actually pretty good. Yeah. So, based on this, you know, Microsoft admitted they were looking into this, and then just the other day, yesterday, I guess, they said, "We think we found it," ah. and and it's a. Th they wouldn't say who it was, but they said it was a third party app. Well, that's not helpful. How do I know what to <laughs> uninstall? Well, they they're talking to these people, and yeah. they're going to have them change, whatever. But I just don't understand. Given what I just said, you know, or given what I said about multitasking Windows Phone, how that's even possible. Well, uh, you know, I'm only thinking about my experience with the iPhone. The iPhone didn't multitask except Apple. You know, you could play the, and I'm sure this is the case on the Zoom, I'm Zoom, the yep. Windows Phone. You could play the Zoom music, right, while you're doing something else. So there's some multitasking. It's just Microsoft controls it. Isn't that right? Or am I wrong? Can you, if you're playing music, you can't do anything else? No, you can play me. Micro, everything that Microsoft makes on the phone basically multitasks. It multitasks, uh, right. Third-party apps don't, but that's that's the thing. They're saying, and it's interesting how they worded this, we have determined that a third-party solution, it doesn't actually say an app, uh, commonly accessed from Windows phones uh, is configured in a manner that potentially causes larger than... It, it's got to be Facebook. It has got to be Facebook. I, I, It can't possibly be an app. Because that came with the phone... But it comes with the phone. It probably you know, when, was if, designed with, well, it could have been, that could be all right. a third-party app from Microsoft's point of view, even though it, it came with the phone. Okay, fine, except for one thing. People use this stuff, and they have whatever data tier they have, and if they exceed it, as you know from Paris, you pay a lot of money. Yeah. For that additional data. Yeah. You know, this is, this is thank, <laughs> thank God they don't have too many users yet, because... This is the type of thing where a class action lawsuit could start because people's phone bills are going up because the thing's sitting there in the corner, and, and let's pretend it's Facebook because we really don't know, and it's sitting there downloading feeds or whatever it does in the background, even though you're not using the thing. And, and that's just bad design. You know, I mean, that's crazy. And they ship, if, if that's what it is, they, if that is what it is, they ship it as part of Windows Phone. I'm not saying it is, but I, I can't imagine... There's any third-party app that's popular enough that it impacts that many people, and happens to be the app that's running. In the it just doesn't make sense. So again, you know, Mike, these guys unfortunately have a history now of not being very transparent. So I'm glad they think they found something. I'm glad. I hope they found it, but they they're not really being very upfront about it as usual, and that's it's just too bad. Well, we'll learn more. Um... Nobody, yeah. none of the people, or if you correspond with anybody who has massive bills because of this? No, I, not yet. It doesn't I mean, sound like I, it's gigabytes of data. It sounds like it's hundreds, extra yeah, hundreds yeah. of I th megabytes. I think the gap between 200 and, you know, megabytes and two gigabytes is great enough that, well, that no I'm one's going about. over it. And, and like I said, in my experience, I'm not coming anywhere close to two gigabytes. So even if I was a heavier user, three times heavier perhaps, I would not usually hit the two gigabyte limit. So... I think that that's, as AT&T said when they changed over, you know, this is going to satisfy the needs of, you know, 98% of our customers. I, I do believe that that's true. But, you know, runaway data is runaway data. And, you know, some of the problems here are things, such things as if you're downloading something on Wi-Fi with Windows Phone and, you, and the screen goes off, it switches to 3G, which is crazy. Or oh. there, there are controls built into Windows Phone that prevent you from starting a download that's over a certain size because... You know, you don't want to do that over your 3G connection because it's too much. But if you switch to 3G, or if there's a software bug when, even though there is Wi-Fi, 
and it still switches to 3G, that download will actually continue. So all, all you have to do to start a big download is be on Wi-Fi when it starts. But if you switch to 3G, the thing will still keep going. It's crazy. So uh, that itself is a bug in, in, in the software, regardless of which program is responsible for this. I mean, and th this is uh, related to the second issue I want to discuss about Windows Phone, which was just the software updating uh, situation. You know, Windows Phone is a, it's a wonderful platform. I mean, it, it just from a pure, you know, pie in the sky standpoint, without regards of all the other things that go into making a phone a good phone, you know, Windows Phone, the software itself is excellent. You know, that said, it's also unfinished. It also has bugs. It's brand new. Of course it has bugs. There are, uh, are going to be security problems and, and just plain software fixes they need to do. Lots of little things. There's stuff like you go into the camera and you turn off the flash. And then you exit the camera, you do something else, you go back to the camera, and the flash is back on because it doesn't know how to save settings for some reason. Clearly a bug. Or you go in, you've seen this, you go into marketplace search, you want to search for an app. You search for some term, it brings back songs, it brings back, you know, um, uh, movies and TV shows, and it brings back everything but the app. You know, there's no way to filter search. These are the types of things that Microsoft should have fixed immediately. Right. You should seamlessly be getting these updates all the time. But here it is three months later, and they haven't released a single software update. You know, this thing that they're talking about, this problem, uh, whether or not it's a third-party app, there are still data downloading issues with Windows Phone that appear to happen where it switches from Wi-Fi to 3G. He, they need to fix. But they're, they're, I mean, what's their, their solution is to wait for this first mega fix whenever it happens late this month, February, later, I don't know. No one knows. They won't say. And Welcome just... to the wonderful world of cell phones and smartphones in particular. I mean... Except for one thing. I was wondering about this because well, when... Uh, you know, Android, people are complaining with Samsungs because they yes. haven't updated to 2.2. Right. And, it's, and you, you, I don't know if you saw that post on XDA developers which said, well, they're not going to do it because it costs the, the carrier... Right. Uh, a lot of money for a feature update. Maybe so, it's the same situation. Maybe Microsoft it, uh, has to pay you know AT&T for... It is. By the way, it is the same situation. Yeah. That's not my concern. Um, <laughs> who cares? My concern is saying. that... No, I, who cares about Android? This is a Windows podcast. No, but I mean, who cares no, about... I, <laughs> so, no, you're saying, um, though, that Microsoft would have to pay AT&T uh, a feature update fee. I don't care what Microsoft fee. has to pay to anybody. Uh, my point is, you buy a phone that... This kind of phone, a high-end phone, by the way, an expensive high-end phone, that has certain promises, explicit and implicit to it. Yeah, One I of those agree. promises is we're going to keep updating this thing and making the value of it better and better and better. I agree. And, and we told, I told you the story at the reviewer's workshop the day after the launch where I ground this thing to a halt because they surprised everybody by announcing, contrary to everything they'd ever said about this in the past, that carriers could, in fact, block software updates from right. appearing on Windows Phone. Right. Now... The thing, here's the thing. Yeah, okay, Android does the same thing. We all know that in the past, you know, Windows Mobile was horrible like this. I don't have any idea or care what the Palm stuff was like, but we don't live in a, a world in which there is no example of how this can be done correctly. We live in a world that is post-iPhone. And I, I'm sorry, but if you intend to compete with the market leader, you have to at least show up. One of the, th I went back and looked because I write so much stuff, I can't keep track of it in my head. But in late 2007 and in early 2008, I wrote an article that I updated every time Apple released a software update. The way it starts is this thing shipped with so many problems and so many missing features. It, it's, I can't believe Apple did this. They need to get moving and update this thing. Just like I'm complaining now about Microsoft. Except the difference is in 2007 and to early 2008, Apple released like something like 9 or 11 software updates for, for iPhone. They updated this thing again and again and again and again and again. And I'm sorry, this is now three and a half years later. You need to show up, and you, that's the baseline. What your number one competitor did three and a half years ago, you need to be able to do at least that. And that's the thing. If you're going to sell this phone to people in its incomplete state, fine. But update it. You have to... Be, you have to Update it. You can't give them something incomplete if you're never going to update it. And I just feel like there's been a, a disconnect between the promise and the reality of Windows Phone. And I'm really disappointed in this. 
And and I guess in the to, to people who are Windows users, I guess I would say the analog here is in the Windows world. There are things that Microsoft calls hot fixes, which are typically small software updates that address individual issues. And then every once in a while, and I'm talking every year to two years or whatever it is, they'll release something called a service pack. And a service pack does all kinds of different things, but the big thing is it's an aggregate of all of the previous hot fixes. That's the point. That's the main point because companies who deploy Windows need to have these things in one update, not in 87 updates. Fine. But what Microsoft has decided to do with Windows Phone is only ship service packs. They're never going to do the hot fixes. So that bug in the camera, the, the bug in the marketplace I discussed, the 111 other bugs that we're not going to get to because there's not enough time in the world. <laughs> they're never going to fix those things individually. They're just going to they're going to fix them all, hopefully, in one big update that will come out whenever it comes out. And I'm sorry, that's that's fine for three years from now, but right now when this thing has so many problems, not fine. It's not it's not right, and it, it's it just God it it just kills me because. You know, I I just don't like. I feel like, I feel like we were lied to. You know, and we were lied to actually. I mean, with regards to the carriers, absolutely, we're lied to. You can go back and see the public statements they made about that and see how they're. It's absolutely a lie. But this thing, I, like I said, it's more of an implicit promise. I don't mind that they ship something incomplete, as long as they update it. You know, it's been three months, guys. Seriously. I, I it's could not, see. It's not right. I could see disappointment, but are you surprised? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you are. See, I, I am. And, I and think what this is is a disconnect between. Yeah. Look at these things are now computers, and yep. we are expecting them to be, with regard to updates and many other things, treated like computers. But we are not in the world of computing well, are, where Microsoft can push hot fixes. You know we are in the world of wireless. You can require the phone to be connected to Wi-Fi fine and then guess what you just bypass the carriers why would they care I, I there's no excuse for this when I turned on my Xbox 360 yesterday and I think we have a note about this for later my Xbox had a software update it was a mandatory update I did have I had no choice I had to install it the Xbox is also a computer it is also updated regularly sometimes they're big updates Sometimes there's small updates. That's how computing devices get updated. That the phone should somehow be different. Different, not just from the other computing devices, but again, different from the market leader. You know, one of the, it shows what's wrong. And one of the things you mentioned, Android, you know, this could have been an advantage. Oh, I Android. agree. There was an opportunity. Show that we missed. learn the lesson. Yeah. Show that we learn from the mistake they made. Instead, they're just making the same mistake. And and by saying, well, Android does it the same way, you know, that doesn't really excuse it. Uh, Apple doesn't, but only because Apple does fewer updates. Uh, I don't know. I, I, look, I haven't I tracked think, every I think also iPhone Apple, updates. and one of the reasons know. Apple was exclusive with AT&T so long is because they were able to extort extraordinary right. concessions from AT&T. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I understand that. But and, again. And, and apparently Microsoft did not do the same. But that's not my problem. My again, my, no. My, I agree with you. I agree with my you. My argument is the Windows Phone came to life late after the iPhone. Microsoft had to have gone to AT and T and Verizon and all the other carriers and said, "Look, see what happened over here. We need to do this. You get it?" And they would have said, "Yep, we get it." I, I don't understand how that's not what happened. You know, uh, they did do some things that show uh, a willingness to change, but then there were these other things that it's just kind of exactly the way they used to be. You know, they took a hard stance, supposedly, we'll see it when this falls apart, on the ability of third parties to change the user interface of the phone. We want that to be consistent, you know? Well, today there is a consistency. The devices are all fairly consistent. Software is absolutely consistent. And I would say that the fact that none of them have been updated in any way, shape, or form is, of course, consistent. But it, I, I think they should all have been updated. I, by this time, seriously, I, I can think of... I probably have documented a hundred different things that could have and arguably should have been fixed by now. I'm not talking about cut and paste. I'm talking about these little stupid things that kind of ruin the experience when you bump into them. It just doesn't make any sense. I, I'm I'm very disappointed. In case you can't tell. again, <laughs> disappointed, but sorry, I, I can't I can't believe that you're surprised by this. I mean, it's just oh well. So the reason I'm surprised is you know it's not just a uh, 
a clueless desire to want to believe. I mean, I look at the way they did Windows Phone. I, I, I watched all the introductory videos, you know, of their events that they had and, you know, the events I went to, of course, as well. And you talk to these guys and you think, you know, they're really trying to do something different. I really believe in this, you know. And, I, and again, I, I want to be very clear I think from a technical perspective, from a user interface perspective, from a developer perspective, uh, Windows Phone, even in this kind of cobbled together, not quite ready for prime time state, is superior in many ways, you know, to the Android and the iOS type stuff. But I also, you know, I mean, look, I don't live in a little ivory tower with no windows. You can see the outside world. I mean, you can see Apple racing ahead with tablets and MP3 players that also run on this platform and all of the apps and the ecosystem that blows up around the stuff and how Android by doing something a little different also millions and millions of users lots of market share lots of different devices that sell well even some ta even though Google hasn't made a version of the OS for tablets there's still tablets out there and one of which is sold in the millions so it's it's not enough you know to just look at this thing and say it's good I mean you have to there's a lot of things you have to compare and what I see oh, I is... I agree. It's a very competitive space they're, they've entered. And I, they're I, late to the game. Yeah, yeah. Microsoft, you know, for Microsoft to... I mean, they worked on this thing for years before they shipped it. But, you know, for them to announce a product like this that's such a complete redo in February and then ship the thing in October slash November is quite a, an accomplishment. I'm sure they're very proud of themselves. And they should be. But, you know, that's when, that's when the race starts, you know? Right. You get this feeling that they just blew it all on this launch and then I, I you know there's no indication that anything has occurred i mean i i i don't know you know they're going to release copy and paste but like i said copy and paste has actually been around for a while they showed it to us the day after the launch it's not like they you know turned on their computers in our in you know november 1st and started coding cut copy and paste they were working on that um and we still haven't seen it so and it's still going to be limited by the way <laughs> but yeah. whatever you know it's I don't know. <laughs> it's very Poor Paul. Somebody get Paul very, like the aggravating cup of coffee or something. I'm feeling bad for you, my friend. I, I, you know, um, I completely agree. Uh, and yet, I mean, this is the frustrate. I mean, Apple owners have been through this for years too. This is the and and boy, Android owners do it in spades. This is the frustration right. of the wireless world. These these guys are appalling monopolists. They're yeah. We, oh, well, and by the way, you know, and I'm not are, talking Microsoft. I'm talking oh, AT&T, AT Sprint, T-Mobile, Verizon. At that event, uh, you know, the reviewers workshop, uh, I, I stopped this thing a couple of times and I said, you've got to be kidding me. These companies have never shown a willingness to do anything other than not update the phone you already have. So you buy a new one. Right. That's their whole business. That's model. their business. No, model. no, no, no. They you know, they, they know that user satisfaction is tied to this. Blah, blah. There was a guy from AT&T in the room. It was probably the most uncomfortable day of his life to have to get up in front of me after that little diatribe and then try to explain how he cared about customers and blah, blah, ah. blah. These people do not care in the slightest no. about updating your phone or, get, you know, they don't. They, they want to sell you something else. That's all they care about. And it's just, like, I you know, I, I'm not happy about being right <laughs> about that but clearly i'd prefer I, to be honest i can live without cut and paste i could it's the little fixes you I talked about, less about cut and paste. that i, I would much prefer it. i want those and, fix the I, camera and, fix and, marketplace and, and and you know you know in this article about uh, uh, about android and about samsung which by the way the response is that t-mobile is now saying okay well okay we'll pay for the feature update so the the article says there are three kinds of updates there's critical fixes there's there's uh, maintenance uh, those are free to the phone the phone carrier, and then there's feature updates free, which add free features. Free from who? Free from who? The care the AT and T does not have to pay the phone manufacturer. It comes from the phone manufacturer, right? Okay. Well, this is what's confusing. You got what, three what, parties what, what, here. You got Microsoft. Little, you've got the manufacturer, like, which is Samsung, LG, whoever, <laughs> HTC, and then you've got the 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 carrier AT and T and T Mobile. These, these are three three groups of companies essentially that are partners. Right, this is true on the Windows Phone side, like it is. But on they the have Android different side. agendas. Not just different agendas, but for them to be as successful as they can be, some other part of this partnership has to has to lose. You know, this is not. 
I'm not a business expert, <laughs> but I, I, I'm I'm more of a, a win-win kind of guy. Yeah, like I don't yeah. I don't that's understand. Why, that's why you and I, I don't get are it, working you know? stiffs. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't have win, that win. Win, win. What are you talking else. about? It's all mine, yeah. baby. I want it all. I, I don't care who pays for what I, in the slightest. I honestly no, believe I what this comes down to is the people who, I, I almost said we're dumb enough, but the people who put their time and their energy and their enthusiasm into backing some platform. Well, Paul, uh, you know, it's disappointing. It's time to grow up. You may love your Windows 7 phone. I don't mean me. I mean... I, you I'm may love like it, a, but it doesn't I mean, love you, Paul. Right. <laughs> you may it's love Microsoft. Not, it's just not that into you. But they, they're really not into you. <laughs> you're not, just I, a... Cons you're a customer. Yeah, I wish they cared I, I, I a little more. I was, I was not referring to me at that point. No, no, I meant us. People. We. Oh, I mean... Users. Us. us users, yeah. Because, and, and this, you and I are absolutely the same in this. We are here not to represent any company. We're here to represent users, which of which we consider ourselves. Yeah. And and to tell, and to, you know, if it takes pitchforks and torches at the at the gates of Microsoft, <laughs> we'll be there. And that's what I, I like about listen, you. I, I'm, I'm looking for a lazy existence. I want everything to actually work <laughs> as it was advertised to work. And I just, you know, I'd Enough like there to be a certain level of integration, <laughs> you know, that uh, especially between the same company's products. I agree. And um, this is the type of thing I'm not seeing, you know. It's disappointing. <sighs> There's a pony in there somewhere, Paul. Just keep digging. It's going to kick me in the head. <laughs> You know, this is this is how the world works, Leo. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give Paul a moment. He, he okay. clearly needs to compose himself, and while he does, I should talk about. <laughs> no, I'm with you. I'm with you 100. percent I completely understand. Uh, as I just, I guess I I would say as an Android user, <laughs> sure. I maybe I'm battle scarred. I'm hard. What phone do you use? I'm sorry. Actually, just, uh, actually, one of the reasons I use I use a uh, Samsung Focus. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, a Samsung Nexus S, which is very much like the Focus. Okay, it's pretty because much the same that hardware. is the one that has the newest. It's the one right. that has the newest Android, and it's the only okay. one so that doesn't gonna, have. The, I was going to ask you, based on what you said, what what is the anticipated release date of this? What is it? Two. I don't even know the version anymore. Well, the, the I'm, this is two three, which is gingerbread. Yeah. But on these older Samsung phones, they don't have yeah. two two yet. They're still on two one. They're they, they're looking for Froyo. T-Mobile today announced that they're going to update the Activate, which is their version of the Galaxy S tomorrow. And I think what that's T-Mobile is saying, they're looking at it and saying, okay, we're going to look. Here's a chance for us to steal, a, uh, which they need badly, to steal yeah. to steal a lead on uh, Verizon and AT and T. Mm -hmm. We'll pay for the update. Probably because they you know don't what? have nearly as many customers. I, I, I'm sorry. We're, we're quickly approaching. Actually, we are right now on the four-year anniversary of when Apple announced the iPhone. That's right. And these companies have all had these many years to figure it out. No. And it's You're astonishing. For all of the of successes them. that Android has had, they're still having issues. And, of course, then we get Windows Phone, and it's nice to see Microsoft bumping into each other, <laughs> like three stooges to get or something. But... You know, from Apple's perspective, oh, they're loving you it. Know, whether you're Steve Jobs or whoever's, you know, Tim Cook or whatever, you, you have to be looking at these guys, these bumbling boobs that are your competitors, and you have got to be the happiest person oh, on yeah. earth. They're loving because it because through no fault of your own, they are incapable of doing what you have done four years later, and it, it's it's just, I mean, <laughs> it's got a, it's unbelievable. And for all you people out there who are waiting for some, you know, concerted tablet. Effort, you know, that's going to take on the iPad. I can tell you, based on what I'm seeing here on the phone side, mm -mm. this is never going to happen. You just forget it. I, this is a waste of time and money. <laughs> oh, he's so bitter. Oh, damn Bitter it. Paul. Why? 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 Oh. Is it that hard? Actually, you know what? I really like the BlackBerry playbook. I was so shocked. Um, I saw it at CES. It's awesome. So what's interesting about that is, you know, it, it's... It's funny. Wi-Fi only looks, initially. Wi-Fi oh, only. Just, just like the iPad. That's okay. No carrier. Well, no, because they don't want to deal with carriers. Oh yeah. So they know. I, I, I think the most, and I'm, I, I've sort of written off WebOS, of course, but you know, no, and we're I, gonna hear something I, I about like that what next I've week. I've seen in yeah. the rumor mill from that. Yeah. And I think the playbook is interesting, and of course, the Zoom is based on Android, but uh, we'll see. You know, maybe they'll get it right on that uh, so far. But you know, what's not in this discussion at all, of course, is anything about Windows. And mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry. You know, I wish I, had, I mean, I wish I had some inkling of good news to say about that. But how is it that you know we're not? That's not even part of the discussion. Steve didn't really even show tablets, did he, in his keynote? We thought he'd have he like. I, I said. I think I said this on the show. He didn't say the word tablet <laughs> until his closing remarks. We, we thought he'd have you know, like he'd be like Moses. Yeah. Did we forget the 57 minute part of this thing that was supposed <laughs> to be on tablets? How did that happen? How did they do that? Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites, my friends. Oh, I got to push a button here because that's, that's pretty dark. They, it is a dark site, but it's not that dark. Squarespace.com, I'm a big Squarespace fan. I use Squarespace for our uh, twit blog, inside.twit.tv. And here, all I'm saying is this is hosting plus software, the best content management system on the market today, automatically updated, automatically, so you never have to worry about security. Uh wasn't real happy on Christmas Day to get that security alert from WordPress. <laughs> they said, you know, I know it's Christmas, but it'd probably be a good idea to update now. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that with Squarespace. They keep it up to date. And look at this. You could try it free. Just go to squarespace.com slash windows. This is how easy it is to set up your first Squarespace site. No credit card, nothing. Just name the site. That's the hardest thing you'll do is name the site and think of a password for it. Then give them your email address. Not They're not harvesting them. They just need it for uh, to, uh, if you forget the password, so they can send you a new one. They don't even ask you to enter the password twice. That's how cash this is. And then a little bitty captcha just to make sure you're not a robot. Now, for two weeks, you've got this site, and you can play with it to your heart's content. And I'm telling you, uh, start with the templates, 60-plus designer styles. They're just gorgeous. And then customize your little heart's content using Ajax, drag and drop. If you know CSS, you could even do even more, but you don't need to. You'll have a beautiful site up and running in no time. Then import your data from all the existing stuff. They've got the big four APIs, movable type, WordPress type ad, and blogger. So that's import and export, in and out, so you're never trapped. And it's, not, it's everything. The links work, the pictures are there, even the comments. So you really, it's a, this is cost, costing you nothing. It's just, you know, the idea is let's see what it would look like to be on Squarespace. Now, once you're there, you get all the benefits, things like the stats, best stats in the world, the iPhone and iPad app that let you not only post content, but to moderate comments, to check your stats, complete integration with all the social sites, Twitter, uh, Facebook, of course, Pandora, though, Flickr, everything. A great galleries if you're a photographer or an artist, forums, Form building, data collection. Just look, if you want to know who uses Squarespace, there's right at squarespace.com slash windows at the top there. There's an examples button. You'll see some great sites from some of the biggest names in the business. They're using Squarespace. Why aren't you? Hey, there's us. <laughs> there's Kevin Pollack. There's Dane Cook. Square, I mean, Dane Cook. He can do anything. He's the man's made of money. He does Squarespace. Sites start at $12, but if you use the promo code WINDOWS on checkout, you'll save 10%, not for the first month or first year, but for the life of your site. The secret behind exceptional websites, squarespace.com slash Windows. Give it a try today. Don't forget to use Windows when you check out to get that 10% off. Are you feeling better, Paul? No. Here's something that will cheer you up. <laughs> the I Apple of three other things. Apple no. sold 11.23 million Macs in uh, calendar year 2009. 14.4 yep. million in 2010. That's a 16% growth. Now, I, I did that. I took the hit. Yep. I am Mr. Apple. 16% growth, Paul. Take that. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, actually, <laughs> that's your cue. That's your cue to jump in and say, ha! I, I, no, actually, no, no, uh, that's, <laughs> that's wrong. That's not, that's not correct. What did you do here, Matt? I, I'm, I'm reading his notes, folks. It's not my fault. I'm <laughs> These are his <laughs> notes. Look, see, it says right here. It says. I think I reversed those growth numbers. Oh, never mind. Oh, you mean the PCs didn't do as well as Max? I, there's all kinds of mistakes in this. PC <laughs> makers sold 348 million, uh, not 248. This is a typographical error. Okay, okay, okay. So, Let's start um, over. Paul, how are PC yes, sales? <laughs> Actually, so PC sales are great. Oh, good. Um, you know. No, they really are. And, and one of the things that Apple is uh, very fond of uh, talking about is how much faster they're growing than right. the rest of the industry. And that, by the way, that's true. They are. You know, um, the, in fact, the 28% figure is, is Apple's year-over-year -year growth for 
2010 and wow yeah 20 percent. it's it's a it's a very big but remember apple's 11 you know 14 million i mean there's right. still it's, a it, fraction there's a lot of upside like one twentieth, yep. one five percent of the total market yeah, but, you know, one of the things that came out, uh, the reason I highlighted this figure was that um, I wanted to see for myself. You know, I have I keep all I keep track of all this stuff, so I wanted to see what it was. Apple is very fond of talking about the biggest numbers possible. So in the, in the fourth quarter of last year, PC sales actually dropped or slowed more than expected, and uh, ex but Mac sales did not. So compared to the industry for the fourth quarter, Apple did very well. But actually... Uh, the PC industry, which went from 300 million PCs in uh, 2009 to almost 350 last year, that's still awesome growth, right? I mean, 16%, oh, yeah. uh, it's still pretty impressive, especially when you consider the size of the market, right? Uh, to go from uh, 300 million to, you know, 310 or 312 would have been great, but like to sell another 50 million, I mean, that's actually pretty impressive. So um, Apple is growing faster. Like you said, it's a smaller market to begin with, but you know, that's why those gains don't make as much of a difference as maybe you would hope for. But I did, I went back and calculated this too. Um, Apple's market share for all of calendar year 2009 overall was 3.74%. So now, for this is worldwide. It's probably bigger than well, the U.S. It's worldwide. There's no yeah. way to do the U.S. stuff because they won't provide they won't those numbers. Yeah. Um, for 2000, or at least accurately. I mean, people do do that, of course. Um, for 2010, it was 4.42%. Um, so that's you know, that's impressive. That's good. That's a nice jump. Um, I, I, you know, some of the stuff I looked at when I, you know, when I look at this stuff is also, I looked at the iPad and how does the iPad impact things? If you accept the fact that the iPad is evolving into something that's going to become more like a computer and computers are going to evolve to be something that's more like the iPad. I mean, at some point in this discussion, we're going to have to put these things on the same page. And um, there are people who desperately want to do that right now and there are people who desperately don't want to do that right now but yeah um from my perspective i think it's just i think it's a little bit of a side discussion but i think this year is going to be maybe the first time when we when we you know can do that realistically but um with the understanding that this calculation doesn't involve the other tablets that were sold like the samsung galaxy tab or ebook readers which some people like to throw in with the tablets plus ebook readers um, nor does it account for the fact that Apple uh, only sold the iPad for nine months of the year, not for um, 12 months of the year. If you lump in iPad sales with Mac sales, um, Apple is suddenly the number two or three PC maker in the world, and they're not even in the top five today. So that's a, that's a pretty dramatic difference. They're nowhere close to catching up with number one, but that's a, I mean, that's a jump of, that's historic. I mean, that's a big, big deal. And I, I, I think it's important enough that it needs to be said because, you know, I look at, at the future of this stuff that we do, you know, I mean, we're sitting in front of very powerful computers and all that, but I think for most people, simpler devices, and of course I'd like to see one based on Windows, but I see no evidence that one is coming, but simpler devices with simpler UIs, uh, App Store, I think, you know, we all agree is part of the story and all that stuff are going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that this year is going to be a big year for the iPad. And for some of the competitors, you know, for uh, some of the WebOS devices, maybe, and the the playbook that you mentioned and so forth. But um, I don't know. It's it's just impressive. You know, uh, the iPad last month sold way higher than anyone thought it was going to, uh, higher than I thought it could. I, I had been saying before, you know, using the most um, enthusiastic predictions, you know, maybe they'll sell, sell you know, seven seven million or six or seven million or something you know um and they outdid that i mean that's you know that's that's crazy so i think it's something we need to keep an eye on i mean obviously you already have an ipod an ipad podcast and so forth but i think coming for up the, next <laughs> yeah you know for the but for the wider pc market um uh, this is going to start impacting things very quickly mm -hmm. this is a big mm -hmm. this is going to be a big deal mm -hmm. you know yeah, and I and I for whatever it's worth too, I, I would also add that um, you know Apple is a kind of a I don't want to call them a boutique PC maker, but they're a, a high end PC maker. You know their products are very expensive. Um, their lowest end laptop right now is a thousand dollars. The iPad is a way for people who aspire to Apple products to get into uh, more Apple stuff at a lower price. I'm not saying the iPad is low priced necessarily, but compared to a MacBook Air or to a um, you know a MacBook. An iPad is inexpensive compared to that kind of thing. So it sits at an interesting place. It's 
and more expensive than an iPod Touch, less expensive than an, a, a you know a notebook or a less expensive than a Mac Mini, let's say, uh, with a monitor especially. And it has all these advantages <laughs> over those other machines as well. Um, some disadvantages, but some advantages. And I, I think that, you know, for, again, for these people, uh, there were a lot of people, we're going to find out here very quickly, you know, I think there were a lot of people who would have bought, would have liked to have bought Apple computers, but couldn't because they were too expensive. And the iPad is now like this new entry level Apple computer, essentially. And again, I think, you know, this year, um, we're going to want to track iPad sales and tablet sales along with any other, you know, PC. I think, I think this is going to be the, the year they mature enough that that is no longer a question like it was last year. And, so, of course, the Microsoft tablets are emerging anything. Emerging there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that uh, Surface. Yeah. It's only seventy six hundred dollars. Oh. <laughs> well, but you know, Surface is coming down. That's interesting. I, I, th that's something. But you know, this is the the car and truck argument again. You know, um, I think it's great that restaurants and casinos can buy these things for less money, but it's not something I care about personally. It's not really as a technology enthusiast something I care about. You know, there's an interesting story someday when Microsoft can run the same OS and assuming it makes sense from a UI perspective on everything from a phone to a tablet of different size, you know, different size tablets to portable and desktop computers, uh, sort of on servers as well. And then to these other wall sized devices or tables and things. I mean, that's a nice little bit of synergy in this science fiction future I just invented because it's not the case today, but it would be, you know, you can sort of see the makings of a plan there. It's just that in typical Michael, Microsoft fashion, it's a year, two years, three years down the road. So, you know, we'll see. It's an interesting world we live in. <laughs> it's an increasingly depressing world we live in. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Paul, you know, it's not my fault you picked the wrong horse. Okay? I'm sorry. Uh, listen, this horse ran great for like 20 plus years. I mean, who ever thought... I'm just the teasing you. I no, it, no, no, no. This is an uh, an absolutely um, notice, relevant conversation. Notice that I have been always in my career very careful. Yeah, not to pick a horse. <laughs> well, I, I'm not a Microsoft guy. I'm not an Apple guy. I'm not a Linux guy. I'm not even a computer guy. When sure. we started doing the radio show, they said, "Well, now you're going to cover more than computers, right?" And I said, "I will cover cell phones, TVs." Yeah. Because the more broadly I, I, I define like, I, this, I, <laughs> the better I for think me. I, I have certain needs for myself, not just because of what I do for a living, but because of the, the level I'm at or whatever it is. So I think for me, you know, full function PC, whether it's a Windows PC or whatever, but I think it's where I'm going to be at for a long time. You know, I can't, it's not like I'm going to be traveling around with an iPad and a keyboard or something. That's never going to happen for me. No, I think that's even but, foolish. I, the people who do that seem to me uh, fitting a square peg in a round hole. I don't think that's yeah, what okay, the iPad but is. I'm just saying, but I think for a lot of people, uh, just bringing around an iPad, you know, some, assuming the iPad 2 is what I think it's going to be, just that device. I mean, I look at people, normal people, you know, my, my parents or my brother or whoever, you know, people who are not into technology like we are. And I think, you know, this kind of solves the problem, doesn't it? You know, it gets yeah. them on Facebook. They can answer email. They can browse the web. This is what they're looking for. They don't have to type. You know, we're, we're, I, I, there is an argument I could have with anybody uh, about keyboards, for example, about why I believe that these island-style keyboards that were popularized by the Mac are garbage and that they are absolutely <laughs> worthless for anyone who intends to do any serious typing. And we're sitting here talking about this topic where the whole world is like, dur, 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 on a touchscreen, and they don't care in the slightest because that's an issue that only matters to people like me, and there are like eight of us. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. I mean, it's it's just funny how this is going. I think inevitably, it's a good thing that we, as a user base, are embracing simplicity. But it's I think it's also hard for those of us who are heavily involved in the computer industry, whether it's PCs or Macs or whatever. You know, we have a certain not just a, like a money investment, but a time and effort investment in doing things a certain way and I think it's very, um, it's off-putting in a way to see this happen because it's, it's an affront, <laughs> you know, it's like a Fisher Price kind of thing and mm -hmm. it's hard to understand, but I think we need to just grasp that and move on. I it is it, true. It's happening. It is true. 
and it, it could be it can be uh, very challenging, uh, especially for you know I'm older than you. I'm an old timer, and um, yeah. and you know uh, it's not easy to watch things change so rapidly and dramatically, and not yearn for the good old days. But in this business, regardless. Mm -hmm. If, if it was better or not, it's not the issue. <laughs> Pro progress marches on, my friend. Sure. Da, ba, da, ba, bum. Well, but I think this trend in particular, the reason it's going to be a big deal is because it is better for such a wide range of people. Yeah. You know, they're not your eye <laughs> necessarily, but. No, I agree. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, it, this is uh, challenging. You know, I often wonder, because Twit really is aimed at an earlier generation of technology enthusiasts. Uh, people who use iPads don't need me. Sure. And right, right, right. And, and likewise. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily need them either because you remember batch commands, you know. Or, <laughs> well, or, I, I kind of do need them, Paul, because <laughs> they're my <laughs> <see> livelihood. <laughs> so, it, you know, but, I, but, I, but you know, hey, uh, this, is, this is life. I, we're going to, I'm reading a book called The... Um, the Master Switch by Tim Wu. Have you read that book? A really interesting book about psych, uh, technology cycles. And um, I haven't gotten far enough into it to really synopsize it. But I, but as I do re, you know finish it, I will I will talk more about this. But it very much is about kind of uh, this life cycle in technology. And look, you know, uh, this is life. Your kids grow up. You get old. You turn into Regis. <laughs> Jeez. I would love to turn into Regis. I know. I'd like his money. By which I mean retired and rich. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because he, he's he's 80 years old. He, he will be 80 years I know, old. I know. I know. And uh, he uh, was at great pains to tell me and everybody around him, I am not retiring. Yeah, I'm, I'm not leaving retiring. this show because yeah. I have another, he basically saying, I got, a, I got a new job. Which is what? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to guess it's somewhere warmer than sleety, yeah. rainy, cold New York, New York. Sure. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking at my third snowfall in, yeah. you know, <laughs> you'd, five you'd days here. I'm, I'm ready. You'd like to move to California, wouldn't you? I might go to Madrid and not come home. <laughs> I, hope, they, I hope they have good internet access there. Because... Who cares? <laughs> uh, we did PC sales numbers. You want to do internet? I mean, sorry, video game sales Yeah, numbers? but actually, for, we should go back because we skipped okay. over the, the thing I had at the top, which is um, I wanted to talk more about the problems with Windows Phone. No, I wanted to. Uh... <laughs> oh, I did. I missed item one, the mystery behind <laughs> Windows 7 Service Pack yeah. 1. So apparently Windows 7 Service Pack 1, and also, which is also the service pack for Windows Server 2008 R2, has leaks online. You know, and, and if you download it and install it, it appears to be very final. Uh, and, you know, there are no beta messages of any kind. And there are a lot of, there's lots of evidence to suggest that this is, is, in fact, that, you know, the final release of SP1. But unfortunately, I also had a... A briefing with the server team, or, and I've, I've got a follow-up thing coming up where I, you know, asked about this, and they told me that you shouldn't believe everything you read online, and that they would be sending me pre-release code sometime soon, and then maybe a week or so after that, the final version, and that this wasn't necessarily it. So I'm not sure what to make, other than I can tell you that that's what they told me, and based on my experience at Microsoft so far this year. I have every expectation that this is, in fact, the final release, and I don't know what the heck's going on, but um, it hasn't been officially released. So if you've been waiting for this for some reason, um, I would expect the actual, you know, the, the public final release to occur sometime in the next week or two, and you'll be able to get it shortly thereafter that. So uh, as far as Windows 7 goes, as we've discussed in the past, there's really nothing going on here. It is that aggregation of hot fixes that I talked about that a traditional service pack is. There aren't any major new features, you know, some small stuff. Um, it's barely worth talking about, you know. The, the, <laughs> well, I'm well, glad I mean, we went back to that point. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, it's, but, but it, it's an important release for a number of reasons, and, and most of them are server-related. Right. So on the server side, that's it's, where a they big, need it. it's okay. a big deal. And I'm not going to, we don't have to go into that. Now, Dr. Mom's but, asking a, an important question. Do you mm -hmm. think that they would roll it out, wait till Patch Tuesday to roll it out, or is it... Uh, no, no, this no. is not tied to when, when they do in a service pack, it's not, a, it's not really considered part of a Patch Tuesday. It's a bigger thing. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is a servicing release, literally. It's, it's uh, it, thus the name. So, no. I mean, and for whatever it's worth, the initial release of this was originally intended for late last year. It would have shipped 
in November. Oh, it's the kind of late then. Was, I really... uh, tech at Europe, yeah. Oh, okay. They discovered a bug in the, the server part of it in the middle of last summer, right before TechEd. And TechEd was going to be TechEd US. Uh, it was in New Orleans last year. And TechEd was where they were going to release the beta. And because of the bug, they had to push it back. So I think it was about three weeks after mm. TechEd. This whole thing just sort of cascaded. So um, really, I, Microsoft, in many ways, does things in a very slow and plodding fashion. But when it comes to something like this, um, those are the guys you want in charge of something like this. So I think it was okay the way they've handled this. It's fine. It's not like the problems we, we see with Windows Phone. And partially because, of course, updates are happening to Windows 7 all the time. Um, that's one of the things they do. So I, I, basically what's going to happen here is that when this thing ships, for most people, the impact is going to be minimal to less than minimal. It's just you'll install it, you'll reboot. And if everything goes correctly, you will notice nothing. You know, that's that's the service pack. So. We just have such a bad history. Uh, uh, with, you know, XP service pack, was it three that was so bad? And uh, No, there was, yeah, this, there was an NT two. service pack that people still... Yeah cry over you know i think it was right. service pack 2 that they re-released you know a, a twice or something <laughs> there was there was some issues there but that's this is all in the past i mean the, the team of people responsible for servicing the windows stuff especially now that it's servicing both server and uh, client at the same time it, it's it's all very well done i don't think we're gonna see any issues like that good i hope you're right um Oh, actually, I wanted to ask you this. IE9, would it come out as, would that be part of SP1, do you think? No. It's a separate thing. Separate, yeah. Oh, never mind. Well, it's like, you know, think about Windows XP Service Pack 3 shipped, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years after XP. Right. Still IE6, right? Right, I mean, right. They're still servicing that thing that came in the, so no, they're not going to ship IE as part of a uh, Service Pack these days. If you've been doing your Patch Tuesday updates, does mm -hmm. Service Pack 1 make much difference to you? No, and that's the point. So if you've been updating all along, which everyone I'm sure has for the most part. God, anybody who listens uh, to this well, show better be, right? I'll, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could, of course, go and download that whole Service Pack installer, you know, the, the Mammoth installer, and, right. and do that kind of thing. But the way you'll really do it is over Windows Update, and you'll do a Delta install. So if you're up to date, the Windows, uh, I'm sorry, the Service Pack 1 update is going to be very quick. Because the installer will examine your system. Oh, that's and find nice. It. Yeah, you already oh, have I all like the that. stuff. Oh, I so love only, that. Yeah, it will only give you the stuff you don't have. So uh, that's why they, you know, they say they'll say they'll give you some estimate when this thing ships that the the size of the server pack download will be anywhere from twenty eight megabytes to you know a gigabyte and a half or something, depending on what you need. And we'll just do that. So it should go very quickly and easily for most people. IE9 on its way in uh, January, February, March, April, May. <laughs> so I think the final release is coming in April. That's just a guess. April, but the uh, but, but the release candidate is coming. The out release candidate soon. is rumored to be coming on February. I'm sorry, January 28th. That's soon. Which is uh, is that a Tuesday? A week and a day. It's a week. Oh, a week from today. It's Friday. Or, yeah, Friday. So we'll see if that happens, but. There have been some leaked images of what it looks like and some of the features and so forth. And uh, Tom Warren, a friend of mine who works over at windrumors.com, uh, was showing me some stuff the other day that he had posted about, you know, this uh, cleaner looking UI. They've, you know, kind of cleaned up all the lines. It doesn't have, you know, if you look at the, if you have IE9 in your system now and you look at the tabs, for example, they look like tabs did in IE8. They're very, they're rounded and they kind of, they're almost old fashioned looking in a way. And in the release candidate version, they've been squared off, and it's it's just a nicer UI treatment. Um, there's some ActiveX changes in there. They announced the tracking protection feature will be in there. The latest rendering engine uh, that came from the recent platform uh, preview builds and all that stuff. So uh, that should be coming soon. I'm, I'm hoping um, I should ask, actually. I, I, <laughs> hopefully I can get, get my hands on this thing soon. So I don't have it yet, but I'd like to see it. Uh, Mark Rasinovich. And we know, skip, I know you his... Skip, you skipped the video game sales thing. Didn't I? Oh, I thought I asked you about that and you said, never mind. <laughs> no, I, I said we should go back. I okay. meant we should go back. Now we should go back. I think we should go back. Item four. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about this last week. I was expecting by the time we did the show that this would have been announced and then remember it didn't happen. This, this, <laughs> so, I tell you, these numbers kind of surprised me. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of surprises in here. Yeah. You know, Nintendo kind of roared back after losing many of the months of 
2010 and, and was number one for the month. And this is uh, U.S. These are Num US number one for the year. Yeah. So, but they also outsold everyone else for the holidays, right? Well, that uh, must be what because they weren't doing so well earlier in the year. So that's what yeah. happened. Yeah. It's interesting. So I think when it when it when Boy. push comes to shove and you got to buy a Christmas present, you know, the low price kind of wins out. I, guess. I think you're right. Now, Microsoft sold more Connects in December. Yep. Than expected. Yeah. Then then true. they then Nintendo sold Wii consoles, like three times yeah. more. Yeah, but of course that's an add-on for an existing piece of hardware and so forth. So I'm not sure those are comparable. You know, uh, um, yeah, but if I'm Microsoft, I'm pretty happy. I mean, that's two hundred fifty oh, yeah, no, dollars no additional doubt, but... revenue over. Uh, yeah, you know. the the problem for Microsoft, I guess, is that December was actually their best month ever for the Xbox 360. How many do they sell? Uh, one point uh, one point nine million for the month. They sold three point two seven million for the quarter. The, the problem is, you know, it's not too far from Nintendo, but then again, it's not too far from Sony either. Right? Sony had one point two million PS3s in the month, so it was all they were kind of tightly bunched up it's there. It's still relatively neck and neck. I mean, there's no no blasto winner. Yeah, and that's the thing. So you have this record month, which is great. You sold a lot of connects, which is great. And again, I think. The important thing for Microsoft is you're expanding the life cycle, which is exactly what right. they're looking for. Right. But, you know, they also, apparently the thing was selling so well they had to take from their stock. So January and February, they're going to run short uh -oh. of consoles. And that means their sales are going to be down again. And we're going to see some interesting stuff. So I guess we'll see whether this means that, you know, uh, the PlayStation 3 has a chance to come back a little bit or, um, you know, we'll see. So we'll see how that how that goes. But anyway, I I, th I think the video game market is a tough market. I mean, um, Microsoft really wants to push how successful this thing is. And I, I guess I sort of see it. But I also, I see little problems behind everything that's successful there. And it's it's too bad for them, you know, that they can't just have this unqualified success. I, given the fact that they had won so many months this year, it would have been neat, I think, and notable had they won December. That would have been a big deal. And the fact that that didn't happen, and maybe this is an app, you know, just a one month anomaly, that's kind of bad news. It's too bad. And then I mentioned the uh, the dashboard update already. I can't remember why, but oh, in the concept of uh, in the context of uh, software updates, but there was a big dashboard update this week for anti piracy, apparently related to Call of Duty, oh. in particular, uh, which explained why it made me do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Can't but uh, you know, I don't. I, it's funny. I don't draw any distinction between mandatory and non-mandatory updates because I'm just like I'm really, I'm just the type of person who would just install anything when it comes to that kind of stuff. You know, so if I don't think if you ever turned on your Xbox and got an install and update message that you would have the choice not to install it. But I actually don't know because I would never have paid attention. I would always just install it. You know, that actually, <laughs> so, it's funny because I'm trying to think. I don't think you can say no. I don't think so. This one was mandatory. I you can that. on the PS3. Which is a good thing because sometimes they do these updates and they really yeah they ruin things yeah I've yeah. seen that yeah the, the Xbox stuff is very strange you know we we, we have a, a group of guys who plays Call of Duty now we play Black Ops but we gather once a month at this guy's house and we uh, spontaneously you know shut down the power in his house by all the Xboxes coming online <laughs> but which did happen twice last week no by you, the way. you're kidding you're not joking no and uh, <laughs> I think his house funny. was wired for electricity in, in the late 1800s or something right. but. He, uh, <laughs> the funny, the, the weird thing that happened to us that night was the, the, um, this is kind of hard to explain, but in Call of Duty, the, the multiplayer game is a game. It's its own game. And then there's a single player game and it, it's actually a different game. You know, they're not, I, they probably share some code, but they're, they're two different things. So if you think about these games from a software updating perspective, Activision or whoever is responsible for this is shipping little updates out to both of these games all the time. And you can look at a version, you know, a build number and see what version you're at. So we had these guys who were trying to connect to us remotely and they weren't, they were getting a, a message no one had ever seen before that the, the version of the playlist was not high enough and they couldn't connect. And what it was, was if you turn off the console and rebooted, Call of Duty actually updated, even though you got no message about it. This, the, the version number went up. Hmm. So some of us were on one version and it must have happened right then or... Maybe they download these things in the up, you know, in the background. I'm not sure how it works, but I'd never be, even been aware that that was happening. But we actually ran into a situation where a couple people couldn't connect to our game because we were all on different versions. And it sounds silly. It's like from the IT crowd, you know, did you try turning it off and turning it on? 
when we turned off the consoles, turned them all back on, they all rebooted, and then the version never changed. And we all had new versions, and then it worked. So there's something going on in the background there as well. It's, it, it's interesting. Um, and I wonder, you know, who knows? There's all kinds of crazy stuff happening on Black Ops these days. So maybe, maybe they, that's addressing that or whatever. But So M M Microsoft now is going to ship another uh, dashboard change. In fact, it might happen as early as today. I can't remember if it's today or tomorrow. But they're going to change the display of the gamer tag, you know, which is your, it looks like a little card that has your, right. Right. your picture and your name and your, your rating and the last games you played and all that stuff. So it's just a UI change. They, they're getting rid of the... Um, one of the little pieces of information that was on there, essentially, and making it look prettier. So you can look for that. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> exciting. So I, I mentioned Mark Krasinovich. He's the guy yeah. who did sysinternals.com, and yep. then Microsoft hired him and brought all of the great, I'm, and we, I still think great sysinternals uh, programs into the fold. I didn't yep. know he was a novelist. Well, he wasn't. Oh. <laughs> I mean, he's written books. I mean, he's written the, you know, the uh, Windows Internals books and all that. Um, he may be the smartest guy I've ever met. He's a great guy. Um, we've actually butted heads, unfortunately, a couple of times over some stuff. But, I mean, m make no mistake, um, if this guy says something is true, it's true. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's just the smartest guy ever. Um, but apparently he's had this idea for a book in his head for a long, long time. And it has been or will be soon published. You can pre-order it now. I happen to um, pre-order it on the Kindle myself. But the book is... It looks like a kind of a cyber thriller. And to me, it looks a lot like the Daniel Juarez books, like the um, uh, Demon and... Um, Freedom TM. Free, Freedom TM. And we'll see. You know, but if you look at the description, if you go to... He's, if anybody's going to write a book called Zero Day, Mark Rosinovich is the guy, at least from the yeah, technical yeah, yeah, point yeah. of view, who should write it. Right. So we'll find out. But you can go check it out. I think this is... Yeah, there's an excerpt online and and you can see... Zero Day, the novel. Yep. Yeah, zerodaythebook.com if you want to check it yeah. out. Yeah, download March. And is he, now I'm curious, is he, uh, let me just click the pre-order. Where does that go to? Is he uh, uh, self-publishing? No, no, no. Um, no, this is in all kinds of different places, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Well, he could still be self-published. I'm curious. That's interesting. Well, it's going to be on the Airliners Kindle. controls abruptly fail mid-flight over the Atlantic. An oil tanker runs aground in Japan when its navigational system suddenly stops dead. Hospitals everywhere have to abandon their databases when patients die. Oh, my God. This is kind of cool. Yeah. And they always have the guy with the square jaw, Jeff Akins. <laughs> <laughs> Former government analyst who quit in disgust after witnessing the gross errors that led up to 9-11 thinks otherwise. Not random. It's an attack. Well, you know, you know from the um, pure point of view of a just, you know, his security knowledge, this would be fascinating. Right. And also, I would say in the wake of the WikiLeaks stuff, right, which included some information about um, the Google stuff in China and all yeah. that. And yeah. also a, a less publicized but equally interesting story. I think it was in the New York Times recently about how um, hackers working for the United States government and also for Israel mm -hmm. uh, attacked Iran. Yep. And Stuxnet. went after their nuclear yep. stuff and actually got their uh, machinery to break down. Yep. <laughs> you know, using a remote attack. I mean, this stuff is. Oh, it's happening. In many maybe. ways, the future of warfare. And yep. uh, yeah, in some ways, is happening now. It's happening. Uh, Very interesting. I, yeah, good for you, Mark. I, I will read it, and I will, yeah, and you and I can review it later at another time. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is shipping OneNote uh, for the iPhone. Yeah, I'm almost afraid. I I, I I like OneNote a lot. Yeah, OneNote is good stuff. Um, I you know, unfortunately, in this day and age, I think there are note taking solutions like Evernote, in particular, that yeah. have really taken off because. Yeah of their availability on so many platforms. I well, think it's funny because other... Evernote really was originally written to compete with OneNote on Windows only. Yeah. And they modified but... their strategy and made it completely cross-platform. Right. Now, OneNote is good stuff. It integrates with SkyDrive. It's actually the one uh, Office app on Windows Phone that does integrate with SkyDrive. Um, so that's actually kind of neat. And I'm a little nervous to compare this to the Windows Phone version. You know, if you have uh, the Bing application on Android or on iPhone, it's actually superior to what's available in some ways on Windows Phone, and I have to wonder if this isn't the case for OneNote. I was told, I can't remember when anymore, last year or maybe the 
I guess it was last year, that I should expect uh, a deluge of iOS apps from Microsoft. And that never really materialized. But I, I wonder now if this isn't the start of it. And maybe we'll see iPad office apps as well as iPhone office apps, you know, Word and Excel and all that. I have no idea. But it seems like that would be the logical you know, place for this to go. And as, I, as someone wrote online uh, when this was announced, I mean, Microsoft has a hardware play occurring here, but, you know, they're a software company. And I think it makes sense for them to want their software to be on all the most popular platforms. It's kind of a return to the way things used to be before Windows took off and was right. such a big deal. You know, Microsoft could just target Windows. But now that you see other platforms that are very popular in other places, not just on the desktop, I think it makes sense for them to do something like how many, this. So, how many? They have Bing, OneNote. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, is that it? There's a Messenger app. Is there? Oh. Right, for Windows Live Messenger. Um, and I think there are a couple of other things. There's a, Microsoft has that bar scanning, the barcode kind of thing that Microsoft. I would love it if they'd put out a, a DOS shell for the iPhone. <laughs> there is a DOS shell for the iPhone, isn't there? Um, Not for Microsoft, but. There might be a. There's a there's a SSH probably or a terminal, but I think DOS. No, I, mean, I, I want to. DOS. I, is it really a think, DOS for the I iPhone? There is a DOS emulator. I think it just came back. Yeah. IDOS. <laughs> I love I it. I don't know what it's called, but That's yeah, funny. Windows Live Messenger. Actually, well, Microsoft the Tag Reader was the one I was thinking of. Tag Reader. Okay. Yeah, that's the big stuff. I mean, that's the those are the. It's basically Bing, OneNote, and Windows Live Messenger. I think are the tier one apps from it's Microsoft. Just, you know, they probably have four guys. Somewhere on the campus. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, but it, I, I hope they have more than four <laughs> because that stuff is, uh, it's getting a little bigger. You might want to pay attention. Do they to that. charge for it? No. So it's really more about uh, encouraging use on the desktop. It's just well, an accessory it's, for it's, it. It's almost, uh, I think it's just a realization that uh, people can access OneNote on the web right. for free. Uh, they can store OneNote notes on the web for free from Office on the PC. And they can also access now from an iPhone or from Windows Phone, of course, as well. And uh, I think when you're out on the go and on the road, uh, taking notes is kind of one of those logical things that is a good capability to have. So it makes some sense that they would lead with this in a way. Um, it's kind but, of ironic. I'm just Somebody just sent me yeah. a link to Engadget that there is, in fact a DOS for the iPhone called yeah, iDOS, yeah. which just was yanked by Apple. It just, it just came, it came back, back yeah. today. Yeah, It's free. It lets you play Wolfenstein 3D and the sure. original Duke Nukem. Oh, wow. Not that that's all that it's, great. It's but basically a game emulator. It even has I a little... I just tried to, keyboard. you know, this is how um, simple I am. I, I tried to grab your screen in the window and move it. I don't know why I just did that. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to... T I'm always trying to touch the screen. That's how bad I am. <laughs> it's... Uh, Make I'm Paul's really head bad. bigger. Just, it doesn't uh, work. You're squishing your head. <laughs> Make it smaller. Well, that works. Uh, let's see here. A couple more stories, and we're going to get our software pick of the week. We have an Audible ad, so we can talk about your book of the week. Yep. Um, Exchange versus Google Apps. I don't know if you've been following this. Well, I, this is, you call this the Battle of the Nines. I Battle like of the Nines. Yeah, I, 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 had to, I had to explain this in my article because I wasn't sure if people would get it. Well, they sometimes uh, when they talk about uptime, they say three nines, four nines, five nines. Yeah, ninety nine point yeah. nine 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 percent uptime would be five nines. Five nines, right? Yeah, and I, that's generally considered to be what they call high availability. You know, and right. and God, it's it's so long ago now. But in the in the years there, where, where the goal was to create a server that would sit inside of a company, if you could achieve five nines of reliability, Ooh. you would accomplish something. This yeah. was a big deal. Yeah. Now, unfortunately today or not unfortunately but unfortunately unfortunately for those people who are interested in reliability we now use hosted services that are out on the public internet and they have all kinds of problems with these things so hitting five nines is no longer the big goal that it used to be and microsoft and google both promise uh, through their service level agreements to customers to paying customers that for gmail and for exchange respectively they will supply at least 99.9 .9 or three nines of availability for those services. And if they don't, uh, they'll uh, compensate customers in different ways. So, so they Google, like pay you if they can't, if they, if they're Actually, down. Microsoft does pay you. They, uh, wow. they give you cash, literally cash money. It comes in, a, in an envelope. Actual like paper bills. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, funny. Yeah, they send like some Guido guy down. That's cute. Kind of I, um, I understand your service. Yeah, yeah. Down. 
Yeah, you got to kiss his ring. It's a typical Microsoft. <laughs> this is your good. So, <laughs> but <laughs> so I saw this. I, I, I wrote a little uh, sarcastic post about this last week, and I know that's shocking knowing me. But um, Google had this post on, I think uh, if it was on the Gmail or the Google Apps blog, I can't remember, where they claimed that l their availability last year was essentially four nines of availability for Gmail through Google Apps. Now, that's, I'm not saying it's impossible. I kind of am saying it's impossible. That's crazy. There's no way it was four nines of availability. But they, <laughs> the other thing they did, and this is even more impossible, and this is what made me kind of just laugh at this, was they claimed that <laughs> Gmail was 46 more times, I think was the figure. Let me see if I can find it. I think they said it was 46 times more reliable than Exchange was last year. More available. Yeah, essentially uh, reliable. I think we, in this context, we can use uptime, availability, and reliability to all mean the same thing. This is what we're talking about, uptime. And I just sort of sat back and thought, Microsoft's going to respond to this in some awesome way. There's no way this is true. So Microsoft has sort of responded, but not in the awesome way I had hoped. But they, they have informed people that, in fact, they met their 99.9%, .9%, i.e. three nines, uh, goal last year for BPOS, which is the hosted version of Exchange. Um, it's not clear when Google talks about Exchange if they mean all of Exchange, right? Because um, different companies host Exchange for themselves internally still, a lot of people. Most Exchange seats today are still internal servers. Um, or whether they meant hosted servers like BPOS or Office 365 or some combination of the two. It's unclear. But anyway, Microsoft says that this is not true. Furthermore, the way that I guess the way that Google calculates uptime is completely different from the way Microsoft does. Well, I'm just doing a little calculation. Five nines is yeah. uh, is uh, eight minutes a year. Oh, I can tell you actually. You're right. So I it this could only have been could, down like look this up. Yeah, it works out to five nines is six seconds of downtime a week over a year. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, four not possible. Nine, not doable. It's oh no, not an, on an internet service. That's that's well, hilarious. I know that Gmail, of course, they're saying Gmail and apps, not Gmail general. See, they, they, well, you know, it's interesting because it's not, when you read it, when you read the post, they're all over the map. It's kind of hard to tell where they're coming from. But Microsoft's basic argument is that Google, the way Google calculates this is completely different from the way they do. And they don't actually count a lot of downtime. Microsoft counts everything. And, uh, you know, from Google's standpoint, if it only affects some customers, it's not downtime because the entire system wasn't down. Microsoft says no. If people oh, anybody access, down is down is down. Yeah. So there's the, there's the the biggest you know uh, issue. So one nine is not so good. Thirty six days so a year. Uh, three nines is eight hours a year. Yeah. Five nines is five and a quarter minutes a year. Six nines is just thirty one so seconds a four, year. Downtime. Four nines means that for one minute. On average, every week, yeah. over the course of a year, the service was unavailable. No more than an hour in a year. That's that's that's. I mean, that's pretty good. I'd I'd take pretty that. good. It's crazy good, especially yeah. for an internet service. But yeah. it's it's inconceivable. I think, Plus, I it's think unclear. It's you know, are they talking about free customers, paying customers? I mean, they only have. They've got to have a tiny percentage of people who are paying for this service. Is that who you're counting? Uh -huh. Just those guys? Yeah. I mean, it's kind. I, I, you know, hate, anyway, it's I hate it when. I hate it when. You know, I have a little pet peeve over this because uh, in my business, what where people lie about numbers is podcast downloads. Oh, right. And I have, a, I just, I hate it when companies use numbers this way and fudge numbers this way to kind of make themselves look good. I've never seen anyone use numbers to lie. Explain how that happens. <laughs> just ask Mark Twain. <laughs> there was, what did he say? There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Statistics, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I hate, almost hate to ask you about this, but it, yep. uh, and, and I just, and I want to do it in a, in a way that is considerate of, uh, Steve Jobs and his personal life, but, oh, okay. There's a, <laughs> what did you think I was going to ask you about? But there I, is, it could have been anything. I don't know. Anything. Could we, I could go anywhere with this one, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. um, but it is germane because Apple, uh, first of all, is a public company. Uh, and so there right. are certain things, certain privacies you give up when you become public. That's just the way it is. If you're going to ask people to give you money, right? then you have a duty to tell them things about their money and and uh, prospects. I think Apple has at, yeah, at, at best or at, at least skirted so illegal yeah. requirements. Yeah. yeah. 
That's actually, I, I don't I have respect his privacy that, as a but person, but I'm just, but so I'm not going to yeah. ask you about that. And, and sure. we have covered that and, you know, his prognosis imagine, and so forth. Yeah, of course, but of course. I think really the question is, what does it mean to Apple? And what is an Apple without Steve Jobs? Yeah, so I can give you a little bit, maybe a very little bit of insight into this because all we have to do is look at Microsoft without Bill Gates and draw some parallels, right? Um, Steve Jobs coming back to Apple was in many ways the start of a new company. It right? was, I yes. Mean, let's, let's, let's call he it that. He saved a moribund company. Yeah, he was so, Lazarus. He brought it back to life. Yeah, because it, and it wasn't just Steve Jobs, right? And it wasn't just Next. I mean, it was uh, he, a lot of the executive team from Next who were his tr you know, close, trusted advisors. It was the technology, of course, that he owned as part of Next. And then the infusion of those people and those technologies into this company. Okay, so I'm going to make the argument that the Apple we see today is a new company that was created basically in December 1996, and that that's the story. So the same guy, and effectively the same basic team. I mean, people have come and gone, Avi Tavanian and so forth, but the same basic team. It's been pretty consistent. And they've done a, you know, I don't know if you noticed, they've done a great job. I'll just throw that out there. But anyway. So now you've got this guy who is sick or not, whatever's wrong with him. I mean, unfortunately, he's going to be, he, maybe he's leaving, right? Maybe he's leaving forever. So how, uh, he, you can't replace a guy like this. And it's exactly like with Bill Gates, right? You can't, Bill Gates, love him or hate him, is who he is. I mean, he's um, one of the founding fathers of our industry. Mm -hmm. Um, he did see an interesting thing about software that no one else really saw, and he made it happen. And he was very successful, and he's mega rich, and he spends all his time with charities and healing the world and all that stuff. But he left Microsoft. Now, you can make good and bad arguments about uh, how he did at the helm and all that. And certainly, his behavior was responsible for a lot of the antitrust stuff, but maybe that was just a something that was going to happen regardless. I mean, you know, you have a, a company that has been scrappy its whole life and it, now it's a dominant superpower. It just doesn't know how to act or whatever. But you, know, you can look at the last several years since he's been gone and maybe draw some parallels to what Apple is facing. And I think the basic issue I have and the, the thing I would say about this is people like that are not replaceable. Mm -hmm. You can't, there is no guy, <laughs> right? We talked about the failure of Ozzy, uh, Ray Ozzy. Who tried the, to replace Bill Gates as a, she, as the, for the vision thing. The vision thing. Yeah. And he was like one of the few people on earth I could even think of who, you know, okay, maybe like he could sort of sit in that role or you talk, talk about a guy like Mark Rosinovich. I mean, there's a really smart guy. He's young, technology minded, you know, maybe, you know, maybe he's a guy who could kind of fill that role for uh, that Bill Gates once filled. But when you look at the Apple side, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's nobody. So the best you have is this group of guys who will dwindle over time and become less effective and try to do what Steve would do, right? It's like the t-shirt, you know, what yeah, would Jesus do? Except yeah. what would Steve do? And unfortunately, that's that's what they're going to have to do. I mean, um, now that said, I mean, I think, I don't think Apple has any choice. I think at this point they do have to replace him permanently as the day-to-day -day guy. I mean, I think Tim Cook clearly has what it takes. And I, I just think it's an uncomfortable topic that needs to be addressed. You know, that you want that guy to uh, health permitting and, and attention span permitting or whatever, or desire permitting to have the same level of impact on products and, and planning and all that stuff. And I'm sure Microsoft would give anything to have Bill Gates come back and just do that. But I don't think he, you know, he's not, I don't think he's going to, I just don't think it makes sense. To be honest, I think it's more likely that Bill goes back than Steve does. <laughs> yeah, to interesting. To be honest. Yeah. Sure. Um, and it, which is very sure. sad. But uh, yes. yep. the, look, the good news in the long run is technology persists, the human spirit persists, and, and great innovations will come from, uh, from every other, you know, realm. Sure. Uh, no company lasts forever. This is that master switch thing. Yeah. Um, and w what is amazing is that and we had, you never know. Yeah, you know, you never sorry. know. But we had Steve Jobs, and he and he had uh, this brilliant visionary had a chance to do his thing in a rare, in a way that's very rare. You know, oh. there's only a handful of industrialists like Henry Ford who really got to do their thing. Yep. And um, there's no, there's no parallel. In there's the no parallel. World. I don't think there's a parallel.
Sure is not. So we're lucky. We're actually very, very fortunate to have had Steve Jobs and Bill yeah. Gates and to have been in a time, and this is what Malcolm Gladwell talks about in, in Outliers, to have been in a time and a place where those two guys had a chance to do their thing. Right. And it changed the world. There's no question they changed the world. Sure. But for everything there, for every time there's a season and, um, you know, uh, it's a chance for somebody else now. Let's just say that it's a chance for somebody else now to do his or her thing. You know, I, I just I, I don't, I don't want to uh, dive into this too deeply, but I I sort of imagine this future where some, you know, future version of some Mac laptop thing will come out and this time it will have a third USB port. Yeah. You know, and people are like, uh, you know, either that or the decision will be it will still only have two. And then the last whoever's running the show, you know, why haven't you? You know what? There's a precedent. Why? Just look at what John Scully and Gil Emilio yeah. released when they ran right. Apple. We've sure. been here. <laughs> We've totally been I know. here. You don't want to go back, right? We I mean, don't want to go back. <laughs> We've been here. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think. Right. So I think to draw just to complete the parallel between Microsoft and Apple here, I mean, I. I uh, these transitions are difficult and don't always work out the way you want them to. So uh, Apple has certainly bucked the uh, industry trends over the past decade. Maybe they can do it again um, here, but it's a tough one, you know, yeah. and so I don't think Microsoft has ever fully recovered from losing Bill Gates. And it, and I honestly, I mean, I, th my day in day out perspective when he left was like, good, get out of here, you know, um, enough. But I wonder now, you know, sometimes you do need that one person who can make things happen. And I, I it seems like Microsoft is missing that today. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, you know, hopefully Apple can make it happen. These moments yeah. when somebody comes along and has an auteur and has a great vision and, and then and then is given permission uh, yeah. to do it uh, don't happen all the time. And right. they're not easily reproduced. And it's sure. very hard for a company to have a sequel. Um, yep. This is just life, but that's well, okay. You, you, know. you know, Mark Zuckerberg or whatever is trying to do that at Facebook. I think Zuckerberg he's, is one of those guys, to be honest. Yeah, maybe, but he's no Bill, he's no um, oh, Steve I Jobs. Know. I, I think he's yeah. one of those guys. Uh, but you, we, we can argue that. Um, yeah. uh, nevertheless, and I'm certainly not eulogizing Steve, and God willing, he will be back. Um, yeah. But well, I, but, right, you know, and that's the other. And, and uh, you know, my new story, I mentioned this. I mean, this is not some partisan technologies stupidity oh heck no i want the guy to be okay i mean I, I i i may disagree with whatever decisions who cares i mean that has nothing to do with this he's a person i want him to be okay um and i he's certainly more than recognize a person. he was he he, tr he transformed the world okay but i mean at the heart of things he's, he's a, a hero i mean in other words as a, as a person just as a human being as any human being you would. i want him to be okay but even more so <laughs> you know. because this guy is an important person I, he see, made a I big difference. I would, <laughs> you don't think okay. he made a difference? Oh, of course he did. I'm okay. just saying my desire for him to be okay has nothing to do right, with I that. I, no, I understand. <laughs> just, of course he did. Yes. Uh, we have lived in the time of giants. We have. We're going to take a break on that sad note and come back. But we do have the Windows Phone app of the week, <laughs> which I'm not going to mention now. Uh, software pick of the week. One and two. And let's start with the Audible pick of the week, which you've been hanging on to from some time. Let me explain first what Audible is. It is kind of your audio bookstore. I was just looking back at my Audible list. I have been an Audible member now, celebrating my 10th anniversary this year. Joined in 2001. Almost 500 books uh, that I have read on audible.com. Those are books I can tell you right now I probably would have never read or maybe I would have read a fraction of that number because I was able to read them in those times when I couldn't read when I was driving my long commute or when I'm at the gym or um, when I'm cleaning the house. That doesn't have a lot. Uh, when I, <laughs> you know, those times when you can't hold a book, Audible's there for me and I love it because it really brought back, brought reading back into my life. And I just think those 500 books are such an important part of what, you know, my thinking. There's so many great books on here. Uh, I want you to go to audible.com right now. Take a look at what's out there. And, uh, and while you do, uh, remember this. You can get a book free. Your first book's free. If you go to audible.com slash windows, you can, um, you can uh, get, uh, you, you sign up for the gold account. So you'll get one book a month with the gold account. And that first month's free, and that book is yours to keep forever. By the way, that book I mentioned, Tim Wu's The Master Switch, is on Audible, if that's something you want to read. 
Sometimes Gosh, I read. You ruined, you ruined my joke. What's your joke? I was going to say, I was going to surprise you by picking that as my pick. Were you really? I really was. I have it sitting here, like, queued up. Have you been listening? No, but now I've gotten it because you spoke about it. It looks awesome. It says, a secret history of the industrial wars behind the rise and fall of the 20th century's great information empires. Hollywood, the, reason, the broadcast uh, networks, and AT&T asking one big question. Could history repeat itself with one giant entity taking control of American information? Fascinating. I, I hope so. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> no, I hope I mean, his I, name I, is I, been, we, we go through these periods with books where they're, uh, they're just good business books or books about our industry in particular, or about technology. And then we, and then there aren't, you right. know. And I think the thing that appealed to me about this is it looks like one of those. I'm hoping we're on an upswing here, but it looks like one of those types of books Classic. that I really enjoy. Uh, yeah. Many called the book of 2010 by a lot of different uh, groups, including the New Yorker magazine. Um, right. Tim Wu is a very bright guy, uh, a law professor who is an expert on Creative Commons, intellectual property, and net neutrality. Um, he is a as as one of the reviewers said a scholar of technology, and right. uh, so if, so those of us who are interested in this stuff, the kind of stuff that frankly we were just talking about, yeah, uh, I agree. This I can't wait to listen. See, to I knew this. you were going to be looking for the book I had written down, and then you were going to be like, "What? You were going to fool me, eh?" <laughs> oh. What? Yeah, because you were going to recommend something you've had for a while, which is... Uh, yeah, it's been kind of sitting here queued up. I, I forget what it's even about. You now. know, it's so funny it, because... Okay, like so you were going to recommend ago. George Bush's book. Yep. I got Jimmy Carter's book. And right. there's also uh, Bill Clinton's book. And I've downloaded yeah. all of them. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. keep thinking, you know, one of these days I'm going to listen to them. <laughs> 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 this is one of the things but you know you, you do with books you buy a book because you because you think it's gonna be good for you and right. you should read it and then there's the books you just can't wait to dig into yeah audible's got them all uh it's seventy five thousand wonderful titles try it free and really i think it's a good idea to pick a book that you're gonna love for the first one so you get a sense of what it would be like to have somebody read to you when you're in your car on a commute or you're, I use it on the Stairmaster, on the uh, rowing, on the bicycle, uh, all the time at the gym. And I just, it's great because I know I'm going to get an hour workout and an hour of reading. Talk about multitasking. Audible.com slash windows. First book's free. Cancel at any time. It's yours to keep. And Paul and I both are uh, recommending the master switch. By Tim Wu, W-U, The Rise and Fall of Information Empires. I have been told by many, many, many of our listeners this is a must-read for those of us in the business. All right, Paul, I'm ready for your Windows 7 phone pick of the week. <laughs> this one is it's called Zombies with three exclamation points. Zombies! That's how you know it's serious. It's, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I mean, in, it seems like this Left 4 Dead type game on the outside, but it's actually, if, if you're not familiar with the board game it's based on, it's a, oh, a, a turn-based game. game. It's, it's like a card. And oh, I got to get it. I love that game. kind yeah. of game. Yeah, and it's, it's really kind of, it's, it's nicely done on the phone. In fact, it almost cries out, if anything, for a bigger screen. It, it's, it, it was, it's something I think that could benefit from that. But it's a, it's a really, um, yeah, it's a fun game, and it, it's, it, it's, it's very unusual for a... For a mobile device, right? I mean, it's just kind of a unique type of game. Um, it's awesome. I kind of want to. I I want to go see this the board version of this just to understand what it's like. I mean, you can get a feel for it from the from the phone version, but clearly uh, there are you know little characters and and uh, you know the the game board, which would be the It'd be fun to get that game. the town layout and all that, and then the the cards, <laughs> you know. So it's probably like Magic the Gathering. Right, it probably is very similar. I'm going to, yeah. in fact, I bet you it's exactly what it is. I am, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going on, the reason I'm gone for three weeks in February is I'm going on a, a geek cruise, Insight Cruise. It's a 12-day right. cruise, plus then we're going to go to Machu Picchu. Um, nice. Yeah, it's really, it's, I, we're going to go to Antarctica, Machu Picchu. It's going to be, I'm so excited, and I hate taking three weeks off. But one of the things, but I can't wait. But one of the things I want to do is bring some board games with me. Because you're, you know, and this is an unusual cruise because you're, there's a lot of sea days. There's like eight or nine sea days. And I have four lectures to give, but that, that still leaves me quite a bit of time where we're sitting looking out the window at the water. So I thought it'd be really fun. So maybe I'll get this. I'm going to bring uh, Settlers of Catan. Um, there's some really cool board games out now. I'm going to see if I can get zombies. That might be kind of fun. Card yeah, game, I guess. Looks neat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's to me. I don't, I don't, do you play cards? Do you ever, 
To me, that's that's vacation. I, that's leisure. I, I'm like the Homer Simpson of cards. You know, the I I have no idea what I'm doing. Go fish. So I'm terrible. <laughs> See, I, I love hearts. I love poker spades. Poker players' dream come true. I love poker. You know, uh, but I like the, actually I like the real card games. Not so much like poker, but I really like the card games, like spades, cribbage. I love. I'll bring a cribbage mm -hmm. board. Uh, it's, I'm terrible, terrible at this. So. <laughs> it's just I you know am. what it is. It's mindless, mind numbing, mindless stuff that you can do in your sleep. That's why you have to get good at it, Paul. You can do in your sleep, and then it's all about the person you're playing with and having a nice conversation while you you know fiddle with the cards. Euchre. Right. I like euchre. Right, 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 right. Rummy. So I used to, when I played poker, I would go for the Chinese food and the beer and the <laughs> kind of male companionship stuff. Yeah, that's exactly and, why I And go. then they would, and apparently there was a fee involved because I would end up paying like yeah. 25 bucks. Yeah. Hundreds yeah. of bucks later. Man, that was yeah. a lot of companionship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, <laughs> that was some good quality time. Maybe a little too much companionship. Yep. Software pick of the week. So I have two this week because the first one's a little... On the weird side. Um, but I know <laughs> and one. use it and like it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I have an iPad. And as you know, I'm a huge fan of the iPad. So I was looking at this thing and AirPlay, oh, you know, the new iOS version had come out and, and AirPlay, all that stuff. And, but I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, I have, you can from the iPad, it's the weirdest thing. You can trigger a video from your home computer and play it on your Apple TV via the iPad, which is crazy. But you can't play it on the iPad. Like, why, why, can't, why can't I, over my home network, play? I could be up in the bedroom or whatever laying down, and right. I, I know I have this movie down on my PC. Why, instead of syncing it up, why can't you play the video from your computer to the iPad? I mean, doesn't that make sense? And it's not part of AirPlay for some reason. And I thought I, I thought I must be missing something, right? Because I'm not like an Apple guy. I don't just innately understand that this is like, you know, this is how we make it work. I looked it up and it, it, it's not there. So there's a software solution called Air Video. And you run a little, it's only for video, I believe, but you run a little server on your PC or your Mac, I guess is probably a Mac version. And then um, you run the app on your iPad and it, it look, or an iPhone or I guess iPod Touch, I only care about it for the iPad, but it allows you to uh, browse the collection of movies or TV shows or whatever that you have on your computer and then play them on the screen. Duh, you know, simple. So the paid version is actually $3, uh, unfortunately, but it's really worth it. If that, if you have this need, um, it works great. It's a neat little solution. Cool. I, yeah. I have no idea why that's not just built in. Apple did something more complicated, but didn't do this one simple thing. I don't know why. It's very strange, but... Um, you can add that functionality. So, because that will only help about 2% of the people listening to this, uh, I also have a second pick, <laughs> which is a, a software called Eraser. And uh, this is one of those things, and this is something I'm, I'm still way, way behind on, but it allows you to securely erase a hard drive or portions of a hard drive. This is a so good program. It, I know this program, yeah. yeah. So if you have to get rid of it, sell it, give it away, whatever. Um, you don't have to worry about someone getting in there and getting your data because, you know, when you do a format or if you do just a regular delete, it doesn't really delete it off the drive. So, just so people understand, uh, you know, because I've talked about D-Band, Darren's boot and nuke. That, that nukes mm -hmm. the whole drive. This yep. is a program you can run under Windows to just securely erase yep. a file at a time or two at a time or whatever. Yeah, I, I wrote a story or, or commentary article a few weeks back called the IT Toolbox. I was talking about some of the mostly software but also hardware tools I use. Um, and we talked about on the podcast how my son had gotten the virus and, you know, all that stuff. And what, one of the little hardware pieces that's really handy to have, um, if you think about laptops or computers, you, you pull a hard drive out of it. How do you interface that thing to your computer without pulling your computer apart and plugging it in internally if you can do that? Especially with a laptop hard drive because, you know, of course, they're smaller and have different connectors. So I have this uh, piece of hardware that basically will accept any SATA or IDE type hard drive on one side, and then it goes in through a USB to your computer. So you never have to open anything up other than, you know, the computer where the hard drive's oh, coming from. Excuse me, I so, have to interrupt. Huge breaking story. Hmm? Uh, Eric Schmidt is stepping down as the Google CEO. Really? Uh, the company just announced in its earnings that Larry Page, co-founder of Google, will take charge of Google's day-to-day -day operations as CEO, Sergey Brin, will devote his energy to strategic products. This is from businessinsider.com. It's part of yeah, the it's earnings good. call. Eric will become executive chairman, focusing externally on deals, partnerships, customers, and broader business relationships. 
Internally, he will act as an advisor to Larry and Sergey. So this is a huge, well, huge in, in story. Some, in, I don't know what's going on there, but that's very yeah. big. just broke. I've always thought there was a, an odd disconnect between him and the two founders and his his style and his. I well, you I think you know what? What I always thought is, well, you you know, you're a founder. You bring in professional uh, help to run the business, and that was, I think, you know, Schmidt was at Novell. Presumably, he knows how to run. Yeah. He's a CEO type, and yet he's a suit. He's a suit, and yet so many miscues and misstatements from him over the last yeah. year. I have to wonder if Larry and Sergey kind of started to feel at odds with him. I know yeah. there was a big battle between him and at least Larry over China. Uh, he wanted to stay in China. Larry Page was eth was ethically and morally offended by them and said, I don't care if it's bad business, we're out. Mm. And I think uh, Eric kind of won that one. In the short term, he lost. But but mm. notice Google's been edging closer and closer to China since. I have to. I don't know what's going on, but this is a huge story. We'll we'll cover it more. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a bit, and I I don't know what the uh, story uh, is all about. Why it's happening? All we know is that uh, once again, uh, Google has announced in its earnings that starting April fourth, um, CEO of Google Eric Schmidt. He's been the CEO for some years now. Yeah. He's stepping down. He will be executive chairman. Larry Page will take over oh, as chief okay. executive officer. By the way. I will say this. There's a line in here, which I have to say is hitting home big time for me, <laughs> which is Google also, the way they say this is, announced plans to streamline decision making mm -hmm. and create clearer lines of responsibility and accountability mm -hmm. at the top of the company. If you're looking for what's wrong with Microsoft in a nutshell, it's that they don't have that. that that's Google's exactly run by a wrong. committee of six or seven people. Including yeah. Larry, Sergey, Eric. Uh, recently, Marissa Meyer was promoted to that committee. Um, Microsoft is run by a cabal yeah. of about 110 yeah. corporate vice I, presidents. I think even that, a committee is yeah. too big and diffuse, frankly. Yeah. Well, maybe, but maybe they agree with you. So maybe that's what they're doing. Very I, this interesting. Is, um, this is the type of step that a relatively young company like Google can still make. You know, whereas I don't think Microsoft has it in it's too late. Their corporate. You know, <laughs> people have called for this and splitting Microsoft up. We've talked about it many, many yeah. times. Somehow simplifying, streamlining yep. a company that has gotten too large to manage, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I can't remember if we talked about this. And if I did, I don't, I'm sorry for beating this to death. But, you know, when I first started covering Microsoft back in the mid 1990s, the executive team was very small. And virtually all of the employees were either program managers or product managers. That's what they had. But of course, as the company grew, and people needed to be uh, given promotions and so forth. You saw things like, well, senior product manager, senior program manager, you know, general manager, director. And, that, and now what you have is a situation where they must have hundreds and hundreds of corporate vice presidents, you know. And um, it's just a create, and they've created under these people, of course, an insane amount of hierarchy and infighting and, you know, people who want their stuff only to succeed. And you basically get people who are just coming in, punching the, you know, clock and, doing what they do because they get shouted down by someone, you know, up in the chain. And uh, it's interesting to see Google taking steps because certainly they're not as bogged down by hierarchy as Microsoft is. And yet here they are taking steps to ensure that that doesn't happen. Huge story, a huge story, and very interesting. We'll go into a breaking news segment. We're gonna we're trying to get comment from uh, Google right now, and uh, immediately after this show, we'll go into a um, yeah breaking news. But this is, yeah, it looks like um, you know they describe their relationship over the past ten years as a triumvirate, where they all had equal right. mm. say in making decisions, but they have agreed to clarify our individual roles. Roles so this clear responsibility and accountability. Here's a wild. Here's a wild card. Think, what yes, if God, Schmidt's going to Apple? Hmm. <laughs> Schmidt was on the board at Apple. Remember, he had to yeah. resign his board seat just a short while ago due to conflicts uh, in business. Um, he joined, uh, Eric Schmidt joined the board of directors. I, I, listen, this is about taking him out of the decision making process. That's I think what this so. Is. I think that's totally oh, it, is. it is. It very clearly it's, is. It's, it's Larry and Sergey saying, sorry, we want the company back. Yeah, yeah. And then he'll do the nice thing and stick around for a little while, but you have to think he's on the way out. Because now he's just an advisor to these people, not co-decision maker which is what he was before uh post
post from an update from the chairman. We'll we'll cover all this in a little bit if you're well, watching. That's, with yeah, us that's the thing to read because that's where I got that information. Yep. Thank you, Paul Thorat. Uh, Windows Weekly is every Thursday at one. Uh, sorry, two o'clock Eastern Time, eleven a.m. Pacific. Except next week, because we're flip flopping with Mac Break Weekly. So we'll be next Tuesday, because Wait, Mac Break Weekly will. <laughs> did, did we tell you this? I don't think so. Oh, sorry. Uh, That's okay. Next Thursday is Macworld Expo, and we're going to be there. And so, I didn't think you'd want to do Windows Weekly at Macworld Expo. <laughs> I would love to do it. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> someone has to go to Macworld Expo. <laughs> yeah. So, what, I'm sorry. What, next week is... Uh, we were thinking, and I'm sorry that nobody mentioned this to you, and I apologize. No, no, no. Uh, January 27th, we will be at Macworld Expo. We were hoping yep. that you would do the show with us January 25th, Tuesday at, at 11 a.m. 11 but we can work that out uh, off oh, that's the air. That works. Does that's it work? Fine. All right. So, folks, that's when you should tune in next week for Windows Weekly. Sorry to jump you with that, Paul. I thought you'd been contacted. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I got a note here. Don't forget, Windows Weekly and Mac break will swim up next week due to Mac World. Um, listen, I am pumped for Mac World. <laughs> you lie! <laughs> can't, such a lie. I can't wait. Oh, me neither. Yes. Forget CES. Forget South right. by Southwest. Forget E3, the I, real I event of the be, year. It's going to be a, a bit of an intimate arrangement <laughs> this year <laughs> with your closest friends. Well, we'll be there. We're going to be on stage. Uh, this Pixel Core's got a stage at Macworld Expo. We'll be there the 27th doing uh, Windows, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mac Break Weekly at 11 a.m. Thursday and at this time. And uh, iPad Today will do from the field there as well. But you will be back next Tuesday, and I will see you So wait, let me just so I understand this. <laughs> Are you are you going to do Macworld? What's it called? Mac, Mac Break, Break Weekly. Weekly. Yeah. From the Macworld show? Like you're going to be there doing it live? Yeah. Okay. That's neat. <laughs> Have fun with that. You're so dry, Paul. I can never tell if you're uh, joking or serious. It is neat. It's neat. Well, where else? You think we should do it at the Winheck? That, that just, that hurts. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. PDC? <laughs> uh. Mac World Expo is next week, and the entire world awaits with bated breath. Paul Therott, <laughs> but not your crew, is the editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, windowsupersite.com. He is also the author of Windows 7, I'm sorry, Windows Phone Secrets, as well as Windows 7 Secrets, and uh, uh, news editor for Windows IT Pro, and of course, an analyst for Penton Media, and is always here with his cheerful attitude and his <laughs> upbeat presence. You know what? I'm thinking next Tuesday is going to be awesome because clearly in the two and a half days that are going to pass between now and then, Microsoft will right the ship and everything will be fine. Absolutely. You'll be back. You will be so happy. Yep. I'll be energized you again. You will be energized again, and I can't wait. What else could happen? This, this is the only, it's the only way this could turn up. <laughs> Paul, thanks for joining us. Cheer up, dude. It's going to be okay. We'll if it's you. not, I'll join you at Macworld. <laughs> Whatever it's called. Macworld Expo. <laughs> see you next week on Windows Weekly. Bye bye, Paul. Bye. Right, thank you. So, February 1, I am boarding LAN 2096, bound for yep. Lima, Peru, a nonstop. 10-hour, 50-minute flight, mm -hmm. SFO to LIM, then from LIM to Buenos Aires, Argentina. I will be there for a total of three weeks and shall return the early morning of the 21st of February. 21st? Three long weeks without... Ay, caramba. Ay, 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 ay. So that means... Okay. Thank you, Web4077. I appreciate the invective. He says, Paul, tell Leo to snap out of it and answer the damn question. Yep. So <laughs> on the 17th of February, actually, this doesn't affect you in the slightest, so let's not worry about that. I think Merritt will be doing the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen, I'm, cr I'm counting the days, but <laughs> on the... <t> <laughs> you son of a beach. No, I'm kidding.